Hi, it's James Kotecki here to tell you about my favorite part of CES, C-Space. C-Space at CES is where leading brands come to discover disruptive trends and how those trends are shaping the future of advertising, brand marketing, and entertainment. Be a part of CES. Promote your brand through curated experiences and connect with influencers, prospective partners, executives, and industry leaders. If you have a product or technology that changes the way consumers behave, C-Space is the place for you. So go to ces.tech slash cspace and learn more. This is CES Tech Talk. I'm James Kotecki. CES 2024 is January 9th through 12th in Las Vegas, and it's time to build the hype. So let's get smart about the world's most influential tech event. Today, we dive into consumer entertainment trends that will shape CES 2024 and beyond. And who better to guide us through this world than Jessica Booth, the Director of Market Research at the Consumer Technology Association, the producers of CES and this very podcast. Also joining me is Andrew Wallenstein, President and Chief Media Analyst of the Variety Intelligence Platform, That's Variety's subscription service for analysis of the entertainment industry. So I spoke to Andrew early this year in the C-Space studio at CES 2023, but now we are deep into the summer. Writers and actors are on strike. Companies are making plans for CES 2024, but what kind of entertainment future should they expect? Andrew, Jessica, thank you for gazing into the crystal ball with us. Welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you, James. So, Jessica, you're looking at these trends for the Consumer Technology Association. It it feels safe, seems safe to say that from a consumer perspective, it's all about streaming. That's the future. Is that true? And kind of can you give us some data points just to help us ground this conversation? Absolutely. And I will say I was kind of stunned by the numbers in a good way. Throughout the year, we're kind of tracking ownership, purchase intent, And we're looking at a lot of different consumer data points. And in our July sales and forecast, we specifically looked at the streaming numbers. And at that point, we saw that consumers were planning to spend $46.5 billion, billion with a B, on Mm -hmm. streaming services. And I am not ashamed to admit I am feeding into that number myself. I'm sure you guys Mm -hmm. are as well. But I think that's a really exciting number and shows that consumers are really engaged with streaming services. Do you have a sense of how many of these the average person actually streams? I have Netflix, I have Hulu, I have Disney Plus, Max, Paramount, uh, all these things. I, I, I don't know how many people have. Maybe Andrew might have a number of how many they actually have, but I was just saying holistically, the 46.5 billion is a yeah. great number that we're seeing that consumers are leaning into. And we're actually going to see that grow in the upcoming year to 48.5. Um, so we really are seeing that consumers are adapting and really like that streaming uh, technology mm-hmm. and are continuing to consume a lot um, on their mobile, their television, and really buying a lot of devices that are kind of helping them uh, consume. I know I've seen a lot of different stats in terms of how many services per household. And uh, depending on what you look at, that number deviates a bit. I believe the one I saw back a number of months ago from Deloitte said it was about four, 4.5 uh, yeah. per household. And I'd be surprised if it goes further up than that, because uh, that's a big number. Yeah. And uh, there's so much content out there. And so obviously, we've got this huge growth in streaming. The future looks bright if you're just from the perspective of who, though, right? Because, Andrew, as you digest this data, as you think about that, that number, that huge number, and you look at it through the lens of the entertainment industry, how do industry leaders feel about this trend towards the streaming future as we stand here in the middle of 2023? Well, let's let's drill a little deeper than that big top line number. And, and I think uh, there may be some more troubling trends, especially as I sit here in Los Angeles, where we're a few weeks into two strikes and uh, things do look a little bleaker, regardless of whether you're a streaming service, you're a television network, you're a movie studio. I think the streaming services 
are at a point right now where there is some maturation going on to those services. I don't think we're going to see much more growth, at least at the rate that we've seen in recent years. I think you're going to see uh, probably coming out of that uh, of those strikes, which, you know, they could last for a while. I think regardless of how long they last, my guess is you're going to see the pricing coming out of the strike for these streaming services really start to get up there. And I think that will affect mm. the growth of the streaming services. And so um, uh, we may very well be seeing right now in that 46, or as Jessica said, we could see it get to 48. I, I doubt that number is going to continue to grow uh, at much higher a pace for too much longer. So um, let, let's enjoy the good times while they're there to be had, I guess I'd say. When the streaming trends really seemed to kick off um, a few years ago, and I've, I remember I've been talking about this at CES C-Space Studio for several years in a row, so it's been going on for a little while. I, there was a lot of optimism, right? A lot of uncertainty and a lot of optimism. Streaming is the future. We all have to be in it. Let's invest a ton of money. Let's put tons into the amount of content that we have. Let's get super high quality content out there. People will flock to these services and eventually, you know, we'll all be profitable was the the hope and the expectation. Did something change in the underlying reality here? What was what 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 was the uh what what was missed? What changed? What should have been anticipated? Was it COVID? Was it something else? Yeah, uh, something changed. It's called everything. <laughs> um, COVID, I think, actually was a bit of a boost uh, for the streaming service. And I think uh, accelerated growth uh, artificially uh, to some degree. And what happened was, uh, first of all, I think Wall Street woke up to the fact that profitability was more important than just, you know, growth for growth's sake. And the sort of uh, carte blanche that these companies had to just, you know, grow by any means necessary, spend whatever you want, uh, simply wasn't allowed anymore. Uh, and I think that was somewhat triggered by the fact that Netflix actually started in 2022 to see some declines. And that was really what brought in this new austerity that is still with us uh, to a large degree. And, you know, then you've got these strikes, even before the strikes, just in anticipation of the strikes, which, you know, did not catch this industry by surprise. Uh, an austerity came in uh, the the peak TV phenomenon of spending on hundreds and hundreds of series mm -hmm. well before the strike. The breaks were starting to be applied and we are heading into a very, very different climate. Uh, we're well into that climate right now. And I think we're going to see a very different set of rules applied to just about every aspect of the business. Wouldn't you say, Jessica? Yeah. I would agree. I think that, you know, seeing where Netflix is applying um, different pricing structures, I think that's going to be interesting as we kind of watch the strike and then see how the password crackdown and all of these different elements are playing into the streaming service model right now. And I think that in itself with how streaming content kind of shuffles right now. So we see a lot of um, shuffling with what they're actually putting out there versus what they have in reserve, right? So we do have a lot of content that's backed up. So they do have a lot of reserve that they can push out for consumers. So I think we're going to see a lot of binging of older content right now that will kind of protect what they can push out to consumers. But again, we're going to have that tier based approach coming out. And I think that'll kind of protect the pricing model um, for a lot of these streaming services. And we'll kind of continue to see that um, help. And, and is this kind of a victims of their own success um, uh, situation here in the sense that you know, for years, I think if you if you ask anyone who even, you know, really likes watching TV, there's just too much TV to watch. There's too many movies coming out to watch. They're all great. I, I, there's so many critically acclaimed things on all these different streaming services. I've never gotten a chance to catch up. And, you know, now we're well beyond COVID, obviously. So people aren't, you know, uh, maybe spending as much time with their screens as they were at maybe at the, the peak of that uh, lockdown phenomenon. So I want to push on this question a little bit more of like, is this a genuine concern or fear or just a real thing that's going to happen where, 
consumers may not necessarily notice if there's a slowdown in the amount of streaming content that's coming out, either for austerity reasons or strike reasons, because they can just go watch so much other stuff that's relatively recent, still looks as good as the stuff that they're used to watching, and they can just finally catch up on all of these things. Andrew, do you think, what do you think? Do consumers care? I think there's a near-term question and a longer term question. I think in the in the near term, it's not going to be as noticeable. I think, you know, first of all, there's the strikes are really going to impact scripted content more so. You know, there's still unscripted content won't be as affected, international, documentary, sports. So over the summer, I don't think there'll be much in, of an impact. Uh, as we get into the fall, I think you'll start to see somewhat of an impact more so in linear or broadcast television. Depending on how the strike continues to last and, you know, it could easily last through the end of the year, in, in my opinion, um, I do think you'll start to see an impact. Yes, to your point, I think you will see a, an embracing of the catalog content, the very deep catalogs uh, that are on these streaming services. You're already starting to see. I just saw a stat today uh, that uh, Suits is on, I think, Netflix and another streaming service. And just that's an mm -hmm. old USA show. Meghan Markle, I think, what made her right. famous <laughs> before getting married to uh, Prudence Harry. Um, is doing is setting a record just incredibly embraced and speaks to the power of catalog content. But I do think as we get into a new year, if we still are in a strike area and you start to see really big scripted shows not making their way fast enough to these streaming services, you better believe it will start to impact even those services. So again, a short-term and a long-term impact. Jessica, what do device manufacturers, uh, the folks who are, you know, putting on the huge exhibits at CES, make of all of this, this shakeup, this potential slowdown in the streaming business? Is there a concern that that could hurt sales of these things? Are they doing something about marketing or designing or selling them in a way that is different because of the differences that are maybe coming up in the way that these things are actually streamed? So we aren't seeing a, necessarily a slowdown in how they're being um shipped and or designed, I think that we're still seeing strong um, positioning in terms of those products going out. Um, so just this year, when we did our ownership and market potential, we saw that 63% of people indicated they owned a streaming media device. That was up eight percentage points from last year. So again, a strong foothold within the US household of streaming media devices. And that's where people are still continuing to, again, watch streaming media. And of that, 25% of people are indicating that you're going to continue to buy streaming media devices. And that is, again, upgrading and going in their second or third um, televisions. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing a uh, continue um, growth in our smart TVs. So internet-abled TVs are up to 74% ownership in households, which is about 92 million households, indicating that they have a smart TV. So again, a lot of consumption. I don't see that there's a change in what manufacturers are doing. I think they're still continuing to build. I think they're still continuing to ship out right. and consumers are still consuming and wanting to purchase those type of items. Um, I think it's just, a, again, to Andrew's point, like I don't think there's going to be a short term effect. I think consumers are still going to want to purchase and have these uh, devices ready because they know in the long term the content is going to be there. And I assume that's also kind of going along with internet speeds just continuing to increase or the availability of broadband for folks being able to buy multiple devices and then stream in multiple rooms. You got the kids on their iPads, you got the parents in the other room watching something else, you got somebody else gaming in the next room over. Exactly. I think that we are continuing to watch um, as broadband uh, continues to speed up. But I also think there's another um, interesting point that you bring up about how people are consuming their content, right? So we talk generally about smart TVs and we talk about streaming media devices, but we are seeing a new generation that is consuming uh, content differently. So specifically thinking about Gen Z, in their households among those who are 18 plus, uh, they're not necessarily buying as many TVs. They have a 68% ownership of TV versus the 87% of households um, mm. total owning a television. So there is a different ecosystem of people watching TV or streaming content um, differently. So I think that is like something that everybody's kind of watching right now is how the up and coming generation, GZ, Gen Z, will be watching this content because they're not necessarily sitting in front of a TV to, to consume. And of course, Gen Z, probably more than 
previous generations, although I think all of us are doing this to some extent, is also consuming a lot of, you know, YouTube content, user generated content. And Andrew, I wonder, do the do the distinctions between what it means to be a Netflix show or an HBO Max show with a certain kind of, uh, you know, uh, quality element to them, do those distinctions start to blur, especially for younger generations that are used to watching stuff on YouTube? And oh, by the way, the ability to create really good content yourself and put it up on YouTube and make it look pretty good compared to the stuff you might see on one of those other premium brands is also um, continuing to improve. Not only do I think that's an incredibly important question, I think it's also a very overlooked, underestimated question here in Hollywood where there's such a reflexive, you know, oh, premium content is so much more important. Um, and that's not necessarily the case uh, for a Generation Z that does spend so much more of their time on TikTok and other related plat platforms with short form content. And, you know, as the parent of, of a 15 year old, I could also tell you that they sometimes will watch that content on the big television. Not that mm -hmm. often, but sometimes they do. A and I would also add what's also interesting in terms of, uh, you know, the, the living room screen is, you know, I spent some time this year with executives at Amazon talking about Fire TV and what their hopes are for that. And the thing to keep in mind with uh, younger generations who, to Jessica's point, may not necessarily look to that device in the living room uh, for entertainment as much as they do a, a mobile or laptop is Amazon and, and other players in this space as well don't just design that living room set for entertainment anymore. They're yeah. looking at it as a hub for more than just entertainment, for things like home security, um, the smart home hub that controls so much more than entertainment. And if they get that right, man, there's a huge opportunity there that's so much more than entertainment. And, uh, you know, suddenly you're talking about a much bigger market. And I, I, I think it's way too early to know whether they're nailing that market. But if they do, it's a bigger game. Speaking of the economics of all of this, we need to talk about the advertising component. Increasingly, streaming services are incorporating advertising-based tiers into what they are offering to folks. I talk to advertisers every year at CES. It's obviously increasing levels of sophistication and excitement about what folks are able to do as far as targeting precise people, precise demographics with precisely what they want at the precise time. Jessica, does your research cover any trends uh, in that space relative to the devices where these ads are appearing? The one area that I'm very interested in is device-related ads. So um, as the different streaming services come out with tiers that have ads in them um, and or as they have different tiers as prices might increase, are consumers interested in a, a device that has an ad bar that would supplement these different streaming services? So would that be something that they have an appetite for to really mm -hmm. help them as they kind of look to make the most out of their budget? Okay, so I've bought a smart TV and in the corner there's just kind of this always on ad that I have accepted as a, basically, a, a, I can get a cheaper TV if I get one that just always has an ad in the corner. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And or no cost to the TV as long as they're watching ads. So is that something that oh. a consumer has an appetite for, again, to support their consumption habit of streaming? You know, is that something that they would be willing to, um, you know, go for? Uh, I think there are, you know, different companies kind of toying with that idea right now. Andrew, what's the industry think about uh, about the role of ads uh, in the future of all this? Is there um, is is there a potential here for that to kind of be the the savior of this business? Is that is that what's going to bring these things to a state of relative stability? Uh, you know, I think original equipment manufacturers who are are playing in this game uh, really have. Uh, quite an ace in the hole here in terms of screen level data, what they're able to do with automated content recognition. Uh, you're talking about companies like uh, Vizio, so many others uh, that uh, have data 
that it na- the, the fact that they have this data that they could sell advertisers really changes the economics of their business. It enables them uh, to sell the television and it, it changes the margins that they could expect to sell that television at. Not that they could give it away for free, but right. um, it really changes the game. And I would keep an eye on a, an interesting new company called Tele that has really taken a very different approach where they actually sell the television with a second or and actually maybe they don't even sell it. I think it might give it away for it's free. It's for free. Yeah. It's for free. And it has a second smaller screen that constantly has an ad in it. I, mean, I haven't seen it yet. I'm going to test it soon, actually. And it's like you got to wonder whether these guys are on to something here, whether this could actually be uh, the new model for television and uh, it's going to be a fascinating wow. thing to see how this impacts the marketplace. <laughs> it's really innovative. I think it's an interesting model because it doesn't take away from the screening experience. They can still see the entire screen of the television, but like to your point, the ads are on a second screen. Um, so again, will it supplement the consumer in their budget because they don't have to pay for a device at that point? I would like to think that we have a relatively sophisticated audience that listens to this. And of course, folks who are listening to this particular episode may be particularly versed in the worlds of advertising and streaming. So they may have a slightly different perspective. But I'm just thinking of the average person listening to this conversation. You know, a certain percentage of folks are going to hear what what we're talking about and think it sounds relatively scary. It's kind of a black mirror ish ads always on kind of thing. Of course, we're always being advertised to all the time anyway. So maybe we're already there. But uh, Jessica, what do you know about consumers acceptance of these kinds of additional ads in these places, you know, inviting an ad into my home, essentially, to kind of always be there 24 seven, or however they're doing it, or maybe just when the TV's on, are are consumers coming to basically accept this? I do think it's becoming commonplace in the household. Um, You know, we do have a lot of ads being pushed at us all the time. I think it's uh, trying to get to a point where, um, from an advertiser's perspective, that we're actually getting attention for it, right? So yeah, How do we continue to get the consumer's attention? Because is it just that it's there and consumers have blocked it out? Um, You know, I think that's where the personalizations come in. And we try to get people to understand, like, is that telebar speaking to them? Um, You know, the examples I've seen online is it's they're getting advertisements to order a pizza directly from their TV. Are they going to be using Mm -hmm. that with their experience that they're watching a game and ordering pizza? Um, You know, is it that they're watching something on Netflix and they can continue to watch that as, you know, they order the dress on one of the characters? So I think there's a way to make it a little bit more interactive. James, I have to confess, I literally was thinking about the second episode of the first season of Black Mirror (laughs) when you started talking about this. It is literally my favorite episode of Black Mirror. You're talking about the one with the bikes, right? Where they're they're pedaling and they have to, yeah, and they're seeing ads all the time. It's an interesting world uh, that we live in. Uh, I want to talk about the strike a little bit more. Um, Andrew, you know, you're you're covering this, obviously, as an analyst. but is it difficult to understand and parse out what the future of this strike might be? Is it, I guess what I'm asking is, is, is Hollywood especially difficult to cover because everybody involved from the executives to the writers to the actors, everybody involved in this is a skilled storyteller, basically. And so as far as parsing out what's, what's a story and what's the underlying reality, is that challenging? It's challenging because, uh, you know, in all the years that I've covered this business, I've never been in a moment where things seemed so bleak. There is such a vexing collection of issues at play here. And at this moment, there is no one or number of individuals who seems poised to sort of like pull everyone out of the muck and say, here's the solution. And, uh, you know, that's what's really called for here. Yeah. It's, it's good. There's going to need to be some sleeves rolled up and some really creative thinking. And uh, right now where we stand on July 28th, as we have this conversation, it's, it's, it's a pretty dark moment. Is one possible, obvious, but relatively blunt answer to this that we were in an era of peak TV, And that meant, you know, peak quality, peak consumption, probably peak employment um, and peak profits. And now everybody involved in that is just going to have to get used to less 
we're going to, you know, there's going to be a world of consolidation. Some of these streaming services fail. Um, I like to keep things up, up, upbeat <laughs> on this podcast, but since we want to talk about the actual future and what that could look like, I mean, from the consumer perspective, it seems like we're going to be okay. We're still going to have plenty of stuff to watch on those screens. From an advertiser perspective, it seems relatively exciting because we're going to have a lot more opportunities to target folks in very sophisticated ways that may be more elegantly blended into their lives. But from an industry perspective, the folks who are actually making this content and all sides of the business, that's where the bleakness comes in. So is is it just as simple as saying, we were at the peak, we're not at the peak anymore, and that's just going to mean that someone has to undergo some pain? I think everyone's going to have to undergo some pain. And it's just a question of who's going to make what kind of sacrifice. And, you know, I recently wrote a column about, you know, suggesting like, all right, who's going to be the first to say, this is the concession I'm going to make. And that's mm -hmm. going to be an important first step. Someone has to be like, I am going to do the following. And that will be the tone setter that is necessary for the second person to say, and I'm going to do this. And the third person to say, I'm going to do that. And maybe then we'll get somewhere. Jessica, does your research on you know, as you look at the market, as you look at consumer behavior, purchasing behavior, does it give you any additional insight into how things might actually shake out? Because, you know, it's just, it strikes me that so much of the reason for the streaming business it, even to exist, go through all of the things that it's gone through and be at this moment now, it's all down to just the technology that actually supports it. If we didn't have this technology, this ubiquity of devices, we would be in a different world. So uh, from your perspective, where do you stand? I do think that the technology gives uh, the consumer a streamless uh, and efficient way to connect to content. So I do see that we're seeing a slight uh, decline in cord cutting. So people just don't want to have that box on their, you know, mm -hmm. on their vanities or wherever they're having uh, their TV at. Um, so we are seeing that people again are liking the option to stream content, whether that be like the live TV versus the ability to kind of go through the streaming services. So I think we'll, act, we'll actually get to a point where they enjoy having the streaming content, even if it's less than what they had before, mm -hmm. it's not at the peak. Overall, right. cord cutting is still happening. It's just the boxes. We're talking about the boxes. Right. Because But overall, in term, boxes or no boxes, cord cutting is accelerating, probably, I would bet, uh, permanently uh, declining in a way that is irreversible and is largely a function of the fact that streaming for all its problems yeah. is a compelling alternative and the companies that are in both of these businesses are diverting more and more of their programming energies and yeah. investment into streaming, weakening cord cutting and that is not going to change. And I don't think cord, cu I don't think the pay TV programming world will ever die out completely, but it will hit a floor that will be far from what it once was. And I, I think really the biggest question is sports and how much yeah. of it will convert out of pay TV because it's pretty much almost holding it up single handedly right now. I think it's just a new way of how it actually looks. So to your point, again, like, is it coming through a streaming device or how is it actually coming through in terms of that yeah. cable uh, interaction? Because yeah. how are people viewing, to your point, the live? The reason that sports is on, you know, more on paid TV than live TV, although obviously there's plenty of plenty of live sports that you can also stream or, or, or get without a cable subscription to it. But that's basically a business decision, right? Like there's not necessarily a, a technological reason or barrier that you couldn't just have sports streaming all the time, too. So I'm curious from both of you as we wrap this up, is there a I mean, Andrew, you talk about a floor to paid TV, you know, I guess we can say more traditional cable TV. Is there some fundamental reason that that has to exist or that that still will exist. I, an analogy is people have said about paper, right? If paper didn't exist, someone would still invent it because there, there's certain use cases which it actually is better to have something written on a piece of paper. It lasts for a lot longer. You, you know, you can pass it down. You can have it as an heirloom, things like that. So is there any structural reason for it or is it just going to be the continued business gyrations and kind of inertia of, let's say, maybe largely older folks who don't want to get rid of cable for some reason? That That's what's keeping it afloat. It's a good question. I, I do think it will be largely inertia. I 
don't know that there is any sort of fundamental reason beyond that, that it would exist. I just think there's an older audience that's used to yeah. it and and will, you know, some combination of watered down sports and news uh, that will stick with it. And, you know, maybe that's 30 million people or something and they'll pay for it till the, the bitter end. And, you know, it, it it's kind of like DVDs. Which, yeah. you know, people think has completely disappeared. It hasn't. There's still a business there. It's right. never going to go away. I don't know why it still exists. <laughs> I don't know that there's any actual reason for it, but there are collectors out there. It's a shadow of its former self, but it does still exist. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and, and maybe another answer to that question is just we don't know. For some reason in the future, maybe there is a discovery uh, by folks of some either for, for, for vintage nostalgia purposes or some other kind of technological reason. I'm just like reliability or something like that. The, the aliens take out our Internet and we have to just rely on cable or something. I don't know what it's going to be. Um, well, listen, I really appreciate you both. Uh, for joining me today, Andrew Wallenstein of Variety Intelligence Platform and Jessica Booth of the Consumer Technology Association. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be with you. Thank you. Well, that is our show, CES Tech Talk. That's it for now, but there's always more tech to talk about. So please subscribe to this podcast and you won't miss a moment. And you can get even more CES and prepare for Las Vegas at ces.tech. That's C-E-S dot T-E-C-H. Our show today is produced by Nicole Vitovich and Mason Manuel, recorded by Andrew Lynn and edited by Third Spoon. I'm James Kotecki, talking tech on CES Tech Talk.